on B7, the metabolism of a drug. So on B7, so far we've spoken a little bit about the absorption of drugs into the body, described three factors that affect the rate of absorption, mentioned distribution of a drug. Where, once it's in your bloodstream, where does it go? That goes to the liver, where it can be metabolized, goes to the kidney, where it can be excreted, goes to active sites, goes to inactive sites. All right, so you get a sense of where drugs are going in your body. Metabolism of drugs. Now, the, the term metabolism is also called biotransformation. The principal organ in your body that metabolizes or changes, transforms drugs, is your liver. Now, contrary to what most people think, most people think if you tell them your liver metabolizes the drug, which you all knew, many people think that means that your liver takes a drug and destroys it. It cannot destroy something. There's a concept called the conservation of mass and energy. You cannot destroy something. You can only change the form that it's in. The, what the liver does is it changes the drug into some other form. And in changing the form of the drug, what it usually does is it changes the drug into a more water-soluble form. Now you'd say, well, what's that all about in making it more water-soluble? What's that going to do? By making the drug more water-soluble, it means it's less able to move across cell membranes. It will be less able to move out of the bloodstream or into the bloodstream. It's losing abil its ability to move wherever it wants. Because by making it more water-soluble, less fat-soluble, it can't just move across those membranes of cells. So that's the main goal of the liver, is to make that drug less fat-soluble, more water-soluble, and so therefore it cannot just freely move wherever it wants. This uh, inactive form of the drug, this less uh, fat-soluble or more water-soluble form, facilitates its excretion by the kidneys and this transformed form is called a metabolite. So the metabolite, the metabolized form of a drug, is the more water-soluble form of the drug. All right, so we've learned that the most important organ that's involved in, quote, metabolizing drugs is the liver. We've learned that when we say uh, the liver metabolizes a drug, it doesn't destroy it it changes it into something else. Specifically, it takes the, you see, the active form of a drug, the form that can move out of the bloodstream and enter and affect other cells of the body is the lipid-soluble form. So basically, what the liver basically is trying to do is to change the lipid-soluble form of the drug, it should change it into a water-soluble form. And that means that it will be much easier for the body to excrete it out in the urine, to eliminate it from the body, because it's more difficult for the drug to spread uh, through the body uh, by diffusing across these uh, cell membranes. Now, there are two major types of metabolic reactions that occur in the liver. There are the so-called uh, destructive reactions, or phase one, and then uh, there are, uh, on page uh, B8 at the top, uh, the conjugation reactions, or phase two reactions. Uh, let's first talk about the, the first ones, uh, the destructive reactions. These come the closest that uh, the liver gets to in, quote, destroying a drug. It doesn't really destroy them, but it does change them. So these phase one reactions include hydrolysis, oxidation, reduction, and deamination reactions. Again, we're not making a big deal out of this, so don't get too stressed out. But what does this mean? Lysis means to break apart. A hydrolysis reaction is when a drug is simply split apart. It's not destroyed, but if you break apart off it, then it just doesn't work as well. It doesn't work anymore. It's, it generally makes it more water-soluble and uh, less active. So that's called the metabolized form of the drug. 
So uh, there are a whole bunch of enzymes. When you look up a drug, you will see that they uh, mention enzymes uh, such as esterases and dehydrogenases and amidases that uh, hydrolyze or split apart different kinds of drugs. I'm not asking you to know any of those terms. I just want you to know what a hydrolysis reaction is. It is when a molecule is lysed or broken apart. That makes it le uh, less fat soluble and less active. Another type of reaction that the liver may carry out is our oxidation reactions. Now, all of you can vaguely recall from the days of chemistry oxidation and reduction reactions. Oxidation reactions include the removal of hydrogen atoms uh, from a molecule. That's uh, either you're removing hydrogen or adding oxygen. Those are known as oxidation reactions. Let's look at ethanol. Now, I mentioned ethanol, which is alcohol is turned into fat. Actually, I wasn't fully complete. It is turned into fat, but here's the intermediate steps. What your liver actually does is it changes an alcohol into an aldehyde by oxidizing it and changes an aldehyde into an organic acid. Now, for those of you who took some organic chemistry, you'll recall that an alcohol is an OH. Right? An aldehyde, anybody remember what an aldehyde is? A double bonded oxygen and an H. So you went from an o, uh, a single OH to a double bonded oxygen. All right? And then an organic acid is a double bonded oxygen and an OH. So what are you doing? You're adding more and more oxygen. We're oxidizing. We're making this molecule go from basically an OH, you don't have to know this, to, uh, thi uh, oops, to this, to this. That's really what you're doing. So you're adding more and more oxygen. You're oxidizing the molecule. All that you need to know is that an oxidation reaction is either adding oxygen or removing uh, hydrogens. It's it called oxidation, and that's making it more and more water soluble and uh, less active. Now, uh, eventually, once it turns into an acetic acid, which is also known as acetyl, remember acetyl coenzyme A? Then it do, does what's called a reverse beta oxidation reaction and joins these acetyls into a saturated fat. But I'm not, don't worry about it. Stuff. That's biochemistry. Uh, the, uh, the, you know, methanol is another alcohol. Uh, ethanol is C2H5OH, and methanol is just a one carbon alcohol. So uh, when the, your liver can, uh, oxidizes methanol, it turns it into formaldehyde. And that's why methanol is so toxic, because your liver actually turns it into formaldehyde. So then it's a good way of preserving your brain, but it's going to kill you also. Uh, anyhow, the point is our liver may break apart a molecule. That's called a hydrolysis reaction. It may oxidize a molecule. Uh, the mnemonic that's commonly used for oxidation is oxidation is a loss of hydrogen, OIL, or a gain of oxygen. A reduction reaction is uh, a gain of hydrogen or a, a removal of oxygen. So it's just the reverse. And a deamination reaction is when a nitrogen is removed from an organic molecule. Let's look at an, ex at an example of what it is we're talking about. Look on page uh, B6. So here it shows uh, an oxidation reaction on the top. This is uh, chlorpromazine. Chlorpromazine is a tranquilizer. It's an antipsychotic drug. And I, I put an arrow where it's pointing to sulfur. And I just want you to notice that what the liver does is it adds oxygen right there to that sulfur. That's called an oxidation reaction. What's an oxidation reaction? Either you're adding oxygen or, or removing hydrogen. And so by oxidizing, chlorpromazine, so it now looks like that, that's called the metabolized form, the inactive form, the more water-soluble form.
That's all your liver needs to do, and now your kidneys can eliminate it from the body more easily. Another example, let's show you, that was an oxidation reaction, let's show you a deamination reaction. Deaminate means to remove a nitrogen. So this is showing the drug amphetamine. When you have that ene ending, it's usually an, an, a nitrogen, an NH or an NH2, something like that. So this is amphetamine. So what does the liver do? It removes that nitrogen part. And so now amphetamine looks like this. That's the metabolized form. That's the inactive form. That's the more water-soluble. So these are just examples of an oxidation reaction and a deamination reaction. Now, uh, a second category of reactions on, on page uh, B, B8 are conjugation reactions. Now, what does conjugation mean? Con is Latin for with. You know, chili con carne means chili with beef. That's what it means. <laughs> so con means with. A conjugation reaction is when you take the drug and you attach something onto it. You combine it with something else. And so one of the common conjugation reactions that your liver does is it takes the active drug and it attaches a chemical called glucuronic acid, which is a type of amino acid. It attaches this glucuronic acid onto the drug, which makes it a more water-soluble, inactive form. So attaching glucuronic acid to the drug, which occurs in your liver, turns it into a water-soluble, metabolized, inactive form of the drug. This is called a conjugation reaction. In this case, you're not breaking the molecule apart, as in a hydrolysis reaction. You're not uh, removing hydrogen, as in, in an oxidation reaction, or adding a hydrogen in a reduction reaction, or removing a nitrogen, as in a deamination reaction. You are attaching another uh, molecule, an amino acid called glucuronic acid, onto the drug, and that turns it into this metabolized form, this inactive form. Uh, let's show you a picture of that. Uh, back on B6, in the middle of page B6, so this is showing an example. This is the drug salicylic acid, and here it's showing glucuronic acid being attached to salicylic acid, and by attaching glucuronic acid, to the salicylic acid, that makes it a metabolized form, a metabolite, an inactive form. That's a conjugation reaction. So again, you might say, like, do I have to memorize what a glucuronic acid looks like? No. Mm. Do, do, do you have to memorize all these parts? No. Just know what's a conjugation reaction. It's when you attach another organic molecule onto the drug, typically glucuronic acid. That's called a conjugation reaction. You're attaching it, that turns it into a more water-soluble, le uh, less active form. So that's really what the uh, liver is doing, those are, and the ways in which it uh, inactivates the drug. So it's just little modifications. Now on page B8, on page B8, I listed three factors that can affect how quickly a drug is metabolized. How quickly your liver metabolizes or alters that drug into the inactive form. One of the factors is age. How do you think the age of an individual might uh, affect uh, the rate at which your liver uh, metabolizes a drug? Decreases. Okay, so we would all guess that as you get older, as an elderly person, your organs don't work as well, including your liver, so an old person may not be able to metabolize a drug as quickly. So if they cannot inactivate a drug as quickly, how would you adjust the dosage? You would decrease the dose. 
because they can't break down that drug as quickly as a person in their 20s or 30s. So if you give them the same kind of dose as you'd give a 20 or 30 year old, remember it's taking them longer to inactivate the drug. Not only does this happen with the elderly, how do you think children compare to 20 and 30 year olds? They also uh, uh, break down drugs more slowly because their liver is not fully mature. So in the case of an old person, their liver is too mature. It's uh, old and doesn't work so well. In the case of that of a child, their liver is not fully developed and mature. So this basically means that you reduce dosages in children and in elderly relative to young adults, all right, because of the rate at which the liver works. Another factor is liver disease. If somebody has cirrhosis of the liver, if they have hepatitis, if they have uh, any other type of liver disorder, uh, jaundice, uh, which is typically related to liver problems, so then you would, that means their liver doesn't work as well. It's sick, and therefore you should lower the dose because they cannot metabolize drugs as quickly. And silly, this not only applies to drugs that are prescribed, but even taking Tylenol because Tylenol is metabolized or inactivated in the liver. In fact, if you ever look at the bottle of Tylenol where it gives the warnings, the very first warning listed is liver problems. And then the drug tolerance is where the liver actually becomes faster and faster in breaking down drugs. When, you're ex when you take certain drugs every day, the liver produces more enzymes, and it breaks down that drug at a faster and faster rate. It inactivates it at a faster and faster rate. That's called drug tolerance. What's an example? Let's give you the most common example, probably affects all of you. Coffee, right? Because what we know that this coffee, we have to drink more and more of it to stay awake, all right? So if we actually took a vacation, and stop drinking coffee for a week or two, then our liver actually would have fewer enzymes to break down caffeine. And then after two weeks of not drinking coffee, then sitting down and having a cup of coffee, boom, is that gonna work? <laughs> All right, but when you take it, drink coffee every day, the liver produces more enzymes to break down that caffeine at a faster and faster rate. That's called tolerance. You're developing a tolerance to the drug. You need higher and higher amounts to get the same effect. This happens with many drugs. It doesn't happen with every drug, but it happens with many of them, including uh, narcotic drugs, where the person needs higher and higher doses of the narcotic pain reliever because if they take it all the time. They're developing a tolerance. But caffeine is the simplest example. So uh, anybody who's developed a tolerance to a drug, let's say a pain reliever like a, a, a codeine, will need higher and higher doses to get the same pain relief. Well, one more aspect of metabolism, and that's something called the half-life of a drug. Now, some of you have heard that term half-life applied to radioactive isotopes. Uh, so in our case of a radioactive isotope, they would say like uh, carbon-14 has a half-life of 5,700 years. Uh, what do we mean by half-life of a drug? It's got a slightly different kind of definition. The half-life of a drug is the time it takes for the level when you're in the bloodstream to fall by half. So how long it takes for the peak level in the blood to drop by half is called its half-life, and then it pr progressively continues to drop. Uh, let's look at a diagram that shows that so you can visualize that a little bit better. Uh, if we look on page B6, on page B6 at the bottom, this is the bottom of B6. It's showing uh, this concept called half-life of a drug. Now, it's, whenever you look at a graph, kind of want to take a fast look at what's on the x-axis, what's on the y-axis. So on the x-axis, it's showing time going by in hours. And on the y-axis, it's showing the concentration of the drug in the plasma, in the bloodstream. 
And uh, this, this is showing uh, somebody who took a medication orally, right? They took the drug orally. And so you will notice that what is happening, what's ha let me ask you this, what's happening for the first two hours to the level of the drug in the bloodstream? It's going up. And the explanation is if you swallow a pill, then over the next, beginning within about 30 minutes, 15, 20, 30 minutes, it starts to be absorbed into the bloodstream. And for the next several hours, that drug is being absorbed into the bloodstream. This is, uh, it's being absorbed into the bloodstream, the drug. Now, as it's absorbed, it will eventually reach its peak level. It's true if you take Tylenol, it's true if you take codeine, it's true if you take uh, amoxicillin, so uh, orally. Okay, it reaches its peak level. And then the level in the blood starts to drop. Now, why is the level in the bloodstream starting to go down of this drug? Well, last class meeting, we talked about all about something called metabolism. The drug's being broken down. So uh, it's being turned into an inactive form. So as the drug is being metabolized, and also, I might add, as it's being eliminated or excreted, as it's metabolized and excreted, uh, the level in the blood starts to drop. And it eventually, eventually, will fall back down to zero. <clears throat> now, how long it takes, how long it takes for the drug level to go from its peak level to uh, one half of the peak level, that's called the half-life. So in this particular example, in this particular example, it looks like the drug reached the peak level at about two hours after swallowing the drug. All right, and then about two hours, approximately two hours after reaching the peak level, the level had declined to half. So we would say that the half-life of this drug, this particular drug, is about two hours. It takes, in this particular example, it took two hours for the level of the drug in the bloodstream to decrease by half. Does everybody follow that? And then we would assume that it would continue to decline in the next two hours, it would drop by half again. So approximately every half-life, every two hours, the level of the bloodstream goes down. And this is just the way all drugs work. So uh, back on page uh, B8, back on page B8, So drugs vary a great deal in their half-life. Uh, you'll notice, for example, that the half-life for penicillin is one hour, <clears throat> whereas the half-life for tetracycline is eight hours. Those are both antibiotics. This explains why most times when you have to take penicillin, you commonly have to take a penicillin pill uh, maybe four times a day, three or four times a day. If you're placed on tetracycline, it's likely you might only have to take it once or twice a day. That simply is affected uh, uh, by uh, how quickly certain drugs are metabolized and excreted from the body. Some drugs are metabolized and excreted slowly. Some are metabolized and excreted very quickly. Uh, what would you say about a drug like digitoxin? This is its half-life. Four days. So that means that this is eliminated from the body very, very slowly. That's actually why it gets that ending toxic, because it's potentially very toxic. Because if somebody takes too much of it, it's going to be in their bloodstream for a long time. And uh, we'll be learning that one of the effects of this drug, which is a drug you should know because you will have patients on it, is it slows the heart rate down. So uh, if somebody takes too much digitoxin, it slows their heart rate down, and it, it would take four days for half of that level of the drug in their bloodstream to go down by half. So uh, it, it's eliminated very, very slowly. Okay, let's talk about excretion. Uh, how are drugs excreted? The major organ that excretes drugs are our kidneys. They're not the only way that drugs are excreted or eliminated from our body, but they are the main way. Now, I wrote some stuff here, and I'll just read it to you, and then I have to explain it. Uh, you might remember from anatomy or physio or some of your other classes a little bit about how the kidneys work. 
The kidneys, of course, filter our blood. The process of filtering, of, of uh, filtering out stuff out of the bloodstream is technically called glomerular filtration. And uh, normally about one-tenth of the blood flowing through your kidneys is filtered by these million nephrons or renal tubules that are inside each kidney. And so not all of the blood, as with each single pass of blood through the kidney, not all 100% of the blood is filtered. Usually only, only about 10% is filtered. And the other 90% goes right past the uh, uh, kidneys, and uh, it'll have to be picked up and filtered on the next pass through the kidneys. Um, on, on page uh, D, I'm sorry, uh, B10, on page B10, actually B11, on B11, so we wrote on the top of B11 that another process that you learned about in the kidneys is the kidneys carry on something called tubular reabsorption. And uh, tubular reabsorption, the purpose of it is that when the nephrons of the kidney filter the blood, they not only filter out bad stuff, they also filter out good stuff. And the good stuff has to be reabsorbed back in the bloodstream. Maybe before I continue reading what's here, we should remind you of a kidney. So let's go back to page uh, B9. On page B9, all right, so here's what a kidney looks like. And when we say your kidneys filter the blood, what's actually filtering the blood are these structures called nephrons or renal tubules. They, they're known as nephrons or renal tubules. And there's about a million of these nephrons or renal tubules in each kidney. They are what actually filter the blood. <clears throat> Let's take a look at an enlarged view of this nephron thing right here and see how they filter the blood. So we can see that on the next page, B10. All right, so this is page B10. And this is an enlarged view of a nephron or renal tubule. And uh, what's occurring here, this shows that there is a small artery that actually carries blood into this, to this nephron. Uh, we commonly call this small artery that carries blood into the nephron or renal tubule the afferent arterioli, or afferent glomer uh, afferin glomerular arterioli. And, uh, as the blood flows through these capillaries right here, and these capillaries are known as the glomerulus or glomerular capillaries. Those are the glomer glomerular capillaries or it's commonly just called glomerulus. As the blood flows through these glomerular capillaries, about 10% of the fluid in the bloodstream squirts out. It squirts out of the bloodstream and enters that nephron. And I've tried to represent uh, this fluid squirting out right here where I have a number one. So again, not all 100% of the blood going through this glomerular capillary squirts out, about 10% does. Now the name of this process where fluid is squirting out of the glomerular capillaries. And the glomerulus, it has a name. The name makes perfect sense. It's called glomerular filtration, and it's written right here. So glomerular filtration, and you'll notice I wrote a number one, glomerular filtration, because that's the name of this process where number one is. So that's what's, what it's called. And it simply means that some of the fluid in going through this glomerular capillaries is filtered out. Now what comes out into this nephron or renal tubule is both bad stuff but also good stuff. It includes uh, both the active drug and the metabolized form of the drug, the metabolite, both. So we're getting a number of things squirting out. Now, we said sugars and amino acids are going to be filtered out, and we don't want whatever remains in this nephron or renal tubule is eventually going to come out in the urine. So anything that's good, we want it to be reabsorbed back into the bloodstream, 
and only the bad, quote, bad stuff do we want to keep in this renal tubule and excrete it into the urine. So you will notice that we indicated that as this fluid flows through this nephron, I drew some arrows right here where it has a number two. And what's go what it's showing here, uh, represented by these arrows, is that the, uh, there is active transport of good stuff back into the bloodstream. These blood vessels right here are actually known as the paratubular capillaries. And what's going on here is that the, quote, good stuff is being reabsorbed out of this nephron back into the bloodstream. Now, there's a name for this process of reabsorbing the good stuff back into the bloodstream. And the name makes perfect sense. Down below, I wrote number two is called tubular reabsorption. So tubular reabsorption is the reabsorbing of the, quote, good stuff, the sugars, amino acids, vitamins, and minerals back into the bloodstream. Now, if the good stuff is reabsorbed back into the bloodstream, then what's still remaining in this nephron? Quote, the bad stuff. So basically, what's left in this nephron as it's flowing down through this tube is the bad stuff. Now, in terms of drugs, I'm going to talk and focus on, our focus obviously is drugs, not just talking about nutrients and waste products. But uh, what we're going to see is that uh, the, of the active form of the drug, the active form of the drug, we've said by definition, is the non-ionized lipid-soluble form. And about 50% of the active uh, drug, the lipid-soluble form, active form of the drug that is filtered, about 50% is going to be reabsorbed right back into the bloodstream. 50% will remain in this nephron and come out in the urine. And you might say, D did you write that down? Because uh, Can you say it again? Well, I did write it down. So on page B, if I find it, B11, on page B11, here's what I wrote. Tubular reabsorption. I wrote, uh, let me re uh, look at number two here first. About one half of the lipid-soluble form of a drug that has entered these renal tubules diffuses right back into the bloodstream via the paratubular capillaries so that only a half of the lipid-soluble form of the drug passes into the urine collecting ducts and out in the urine. Again, what does that mean? Of the lipid-soluble form of the drug, the form that can easily move across cell membranes, about half of the drug that was filtered goes right back, it's reabsorbed right, right back into the bloodstream, uh, the other half will come out in your urine. Now, there's also circulating in our blood not only the lipid-soluble form of the drug, but the metabolized form, or metabolite. And we learned last week that the metabolized form is the more water-soluble form. When the liver alters a drug, it principally changes it from a lipid-soluble form to a more water-soluble form. So we wrote here, essentially all of the water-soluble form of the drug which we would call the metabolite. Essentially all, 100% of the metabolized water-soluble form of the drug that has entered the renal tubules will be excreted in the urine. Will be excreted in the urine. So again, let's see that. How would we describe this? What's going on? In terms of drugs, and that's what our focus is, our, our focus is not to review, you know, physiology and, uh, you know, all, all that, but uh, when we say that the blood is being filtered, <coughs> uh, what's being filtered and coming out into this tube is some of the active form of the drug, the lipid-soluble form, and some of the metabolized water-soluble form of the drug. How much of the active form of the drug will remain in the tube? About one half of it. The other half will be reabsorbed into the bloodstream. It will be reabsorbed into the bloodstream. Uh, the half that isn't reabsorbed will remain in this tubule and be eventually excreted out in the urine. 
that will come down this urine collecting duct and be excreted. What about the metabolized form of the drug, the water-soluble form of the drug? By definition, the water-soluble form of the drug cannot readily cross cell membranes. So whatever was filtered and is in this tube, it can't get out of the tube. It's not easily, cannot easily diffuse across the membrane, this membrane, the cell membranes that make up this tube. So essentially all 100% of the metabolized water-soluble form of the drug are going to remain in the tube and will come out in the urine. So you can see that when the liver changes a drug from the lipid-soluble form to the water-soluble form of the drug, that makes it easier for the kidneys to excrete it out of the body and into the <coughs> urine. Because the body's trying to get it out. We might say, but don't we want to keep it in? We may want to keep it in, but the body view, views it as something foreign and it wants to get it out. So once it's been metabolized into that water-soluble form, the kidneys basically will eliminate all 100% of the metabolized water-soluble form. As long as it's in the lipid-soluble form, about 50% of the drug comes right back into the bloodstream. There's one more facet to this. You'll notice that I have a third number right here. And there's a third important process that occurs in the renal tubules, or nephrons, a process called tubular secretion. Now, looking at this arrow, what the arrow is showing is that certain chemicals that are in the bloodstream can be actively transported out of the bloodstream, out of the bloodstream, and transported into this nephron or renal tubule. This is a way of adding additional amounts of substances that are in the blood and getting rid of them, transporting them into this renal tubule or nephron, and then they are excreted in the urine. Now, the name of this process of actively secreting these substances out of the bloodstream into the nephron is called tubular secretion. And that's, we've got a number three here, and right down here, number three is called tubular secretion. Why is it called secretion? Because certain substances, including certain drugs, can be actively transported or secreted out of the bloodstream uh, into that tubule and uh, excreted into the urine. This process will even actively transport not only the water-soluble form, but even the active lipid-soluble form of the drug. So essentially, uh, uh, when you've got tubular secretion uh, uh, transporting certain drugs out, they, these drugs are rapidly eliminated from the bloodstream and excreted in the urine. What's an example of drugs that are actively secreted? Not all drugs are. In fact, most drugs are not. On page B11, on page B11, I'm just going to, under tubular secretion here, um, an example, there's some weak organic acids that are actively pumped or transported out of the bloodstream into the renal tubule or nephron, and uh, they're therefore very rapidly eliminated from the body. These include all penicillins. All penicillins are actively secreted out of the bloodstream into the urine by the nephrons of the kidney. Uh, this is why the half-life of penicillin is so short. We had seen uh, on uh, page uh, B5, uh, B8 that the half-life of penicillin was only one hour, we said on page B8. That's not because it's metabolized so quickly, it's because it's being actively pumped out of the bloodstream and excreted in the urine. And in fact, uh, when they first developed penicillin in the 1940s, it was used during World War II for, to treat wounds, infected wounds of soldiers. They were limited in their production of this miracle drug called penicillin. When they realized that the penicillin is actively pumped out of the bloodstream, the active form of the drug is being pumped out of the bloodstream and appearing in the urine, they would collect the soldier's urine and re-extract that penicillin from their urine so it could be reused again. 
Now, fortunately, we don't have to do that now. But the point is, it was even, most of it was being excreted in the active form. It didn't have to be metabolized because in the case of penicillin, it's actively transported out of the bloodstream by the kidneys. Now, there's another group of antibiotics that are very, very similar to the penicillins, and that's the cephalosporins. So all cephalosporins, which are also antibiotics, are actively secreted out of the bloodstream, and therefore they also have very short half-lives. And if you're wondering, what's a cephalosporin? Does anybody know? Does anybody, can anybody think of a cephalosporin antibiotic? Let me give you an example. Keflex, if you've ever heard of Keflex, or C-Chlor. So Keflex and C-Chlor, if you've ever heard of them, those are cephalosporins. And so uh, if, this, if there weren't any important drugs that were eliminated through this process of tubular secretion, I wouldn't even mention it. But the, the fact, two of the most important categories of antibiotics are actively transported out of the bloodstream into the urine very, very rapidly. That's why they both have very short half I'm not even going to give you any uh, examples of weak organic bases that are actively transported out uh, because they're less important. Now, what if you were told that a patient had kidney disease or a kidney failure? How would that affect how quickly they eliminated a drug out of their body into the urine if they had kidney disease, kidney failure? Would they eliminate the drugs like at the normal rate? No. no. So therefore, somebody whose kidneys don't work, are failing, eliminates drugs more slowly. The point of this is that when people prescribe drugs, that's why they're supposed to know their uh, whole uh, physiology, their whole clinical condition. Because if they've got liver problems, they don't metabolize drugs at the normal rate. If they've got kidney problems, they don't excrete drugs at the normal rate. So you have to adjust the dosages. The, you know, the idea is you're supposed to actually treat an individual patient and not just say, oh, I think they're all the same. Because you've got to take into account how their body is working. Now, uh, while most drugs are excreted from the body in the urine, there are some exceptions. Some drugs are eliminated by what's called biliary secretion. And you might say, what's biliary secretion? So let me remind you that the liver, of course, metabolizes drugs. Most drugs, it releases into the bloodstream and then the kidneys filter it out. But we know that coming from the liver is something called a bile duct. And bile is produced by your liver. So bile can flow from the liver uh, through the bile duct to the intestine. And then uh, whatever enters the intestine might uh, end up coming out in the stool or feces. There are some drugs that are eliminated not through the urine by the kidneys, but are, uh, travel from the liver through the bile duct and come out the intestines in the stool. This is called the biliary route. Generally, those drugs that are excreted by the biliary route have a larger molecular weight. So just as an example, here's a chart, and it, uh, we wrote penicillin. The principal route of elimination is renal. What does that mean? That means that the penicillin, we just explained, is rapidly excreted by the kidneys out into the urine. So the penicillin comes out in your urine. But what did we say about erythromycin, which is another important antibiotic? What did we write here? Hepatic. So in other words, uh, the erythromycin doesn't come out in the urine. It's not eliminated by the kidneys. It actually travels from the liver, hepatic meaning liver, through the bile duct, and it comes out in the stool or feces. Now, you say, okay, so who cares? What difference does it make? This is why erythromycin really affects the intestinal tract, and if anybody has taken erythromycin, it almost makes everybody nauseous, it tends to cause diarrhea and other problems because it comes out in the intest via the intestinal tract in the stool. Uh, you'll notice that acetaminophen, uh, uh, Tylenol, is eliminated primarily through the hepatic route, and same with codeine. 
So again, these are the two major routes. Either the drug is coming out in the urine or it may be coming out in the stool. Um, more drugs come out in the urine, but there are some important ones that come out in the stool or feces. Now, there are some drugs that are eliminated through your lungs. Can you think of an example of a drug that you excrete through the lungs? How about this? You inhale nitrous oxide, and then you exhale it. It doesn't come out in the urine. It doesn't come out in the feces. It, it, you, the patient exhales it. Okay, so that's an example. Uh, another example where a small amount comes out through the lungs, uh, through, uh, by exhaling, a small amount of alcohol comes out that way. So that's why you can detect alcohol on somebody's breath. That's the whole basis of the breath analyzer test. Because you can, no amount of mouthwash is going to conceal the fact that some of the alcohol, as the alcohol in the bloodstream flows through the lungs, some of that alcohol volatilizes and will enter the alveolar uh, air sacs and the person exhales it and you can smell the alcohol on their breath. So uh, some of it is being coming out through the lungs. On page B13, uh, a small number of drugs uh, come out in the sweat. This page B13. And uh, some drugs uh, even uh, come out in the saliva. Uh, an example of a drug that appears in the saliva is tetracycline. Now that's not how all of it is eliminated. But the reason why tetracycline, some of it will appear in the saliva, and in fact, let me hold off on why, because in fact, some drugs will also come out in mother's milk. And an example of a drug that comes out in the saliva and in mother's milk is tetracycline. And why does the antibiotic tetracycline come out in saliva and in mother's milk? Exactly. Say it out loud. It binds to calcium. So wherever there's calcium ions, that's where it tends to attach. So since there's calcium in the saliva and there's calcium in mother's milk, so therefore it comes out in the, in the saliva and in mother's milk. And this is why, as we've said, as you all know, uh, you don't even have to, have to hear it from me, uh, tetracycline isn't given during pregnancy and it's not given during a nur to a nursing mother because it will be transferred, some of it in her milk, to the baby and uh, 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 accumulate in the developing bones and teeth of that uh, uh, newborn. All right, we have been talking about the exciting, or maybe it's not so exciting, world of, of pharmacokinetics. What was that again? Kinetics, kinesis, movement. The movement of the drug through the body. How it was absorbed, how it was distributed, how it was metabolized, and how it's finally, ultimately, excreted.